finally said to them, okay, we will not even drink the water or use you know, the food. Just let us just pass. And if we drink or eat, we will pay you. He said, they said no. Now the Lord was upset with the Edomites because of that. And the Lord sent a prophecy to the prophet Obadiah. And he prophesied that the Edomites will be brought down because of what they did to their brothers, to their blood relatives. But in the meantime, the Lord did not allow Moses and the Israelites to fight the Edomites because they were blood related. But the Edomites were going to be taken down at a certain point. Where do we read that? Listen to the first few verses of, of Obadiah, the, the shortest book in the Bible, only one chapter. The vision of, of, of Obadiah. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard tidings from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations. Rise! Let us rise against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the depths of the rock. What's rock in Latin? Petra. See, that's why I said we're not going to Petra. Because Petra is a description. You who live in the depths of the rock, whose dwelling is high, you say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar like an eagle, through your nest, though your nest is set among the stars, thence I will bring you down, says the Lord. You can finish this book later. But there's the prophecy, Edom was going to be brought down. And this was, when this was fulfilled, was the beginning of the founding of what is known as Petra today. Now when Moses was here, why is it called Wadi Musa? The early Christian believed that he left something behind. His brother Aaron was, had died and he was buried at Mount Mor in the Bible, H-O-R. And that mount is believed to be in Petra, or in what is Petra today, the highest peak. And the early Christians and after them the Muslims built a shrine to commemorate Aaron's death there. And there's a spring that's called Moses Spring. Now what happened after the Edomites did not grant access to Moses and the Israelites? They had to make a U-turn. They had to turn back and go down to the Red Sea, our only access to any open sea which is here, at the far corner of the map. Here, that's... And then they make, made the U-turn and went through the way of the wilderness, which might be on this side or on this side, but I I think it's on our side, it's where we are right now. This would be the way of the wilderness, the desert highway, that they had to use to go up to Mount Debo and then from the plains of Moab to where we were yesterday. Now let's go forward. After many years of this, the Edomites were going to be brought down. What happened is that in the 6th century BC, a group of people by the name Nabataeans or Nabataeans, started coming into Jordan from the northern part of Arabia. Remember we talked about our borders, Iraq, Syria, Saudi Arabia, Israel and Palestine. So they started pushing in and inheriting, taking over the Edomite land. They first started living here in the southern desert of Wadi Rum, the most beautiful desert in the world. Wadi Rum, you might see, you might have seen it in the famous movie Lawrence of Arabia. It was shot there. Or in the most recent movie, Transformers 2, or even The Martian. These movies were all shot here in Wadi Rum. Very beautiful them. They first resided there. And these people, the Nabataeans, are believed to be by the first first century historian Josephus, descendants of Ishmael. Ishmael was the brother of Isaac. From Hagar, from Hagar, the servant of Sarah. Now, how, what, how did they, how did Josephus come to that conclusion? Because of Genesis 25:12, which says the following: that These are the descendants of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar, the Egyptian Sarah's maid, bore to Abraham. 
These are the names of the sons of Ishmael named in the order of their birth. Nabayot, the firstborn of Ishmael, and then Kedar, Abdiel, Ibsan, and so on. Because of the firstborn name, Nabayot, the people thought that they are the descendants of Ishmael. But I don't think that's a very strong uh, proof. I think there's another one in the Bible that actually connects these people to Ishmael even stronger. But before I tell you what that other verse is that I found, let's go back to see what they did, these people. Why did they come here? What was so special about coming into this desert? Now, this is the right tip of the Red Sea. These people were already Persians. They were sailors. They would go from the south part of Arabia, down here, through the Red Sea, with goods that they took from the southern part of Arabia, from Yemen, Oman, and also from China and India. And these things that they traded in were very important and they would bring them a lot of money, very valuable stuff. was very important to the Egyptians and the Greeks and the Romans and the Babylonians and the Assyrians. Everybody wanted that thing that they traded in. Do you know what I'm talking about? Very, very valuable thing in that time. even fit as a gift to a newborn king. Frankincense, near gold. Gold was the byproduct of their trade. But yes, but the frankincense and near were very, very valuable. Everybody needed them, everybody wanted them. Rome was very religious. The Greeks, the Egyptians used them also, the frankincense and the near for embalmment, for medicinal uses. These were things that were very valuable. One gram of frankincense and were, were equal to two grams of gold at that time. And they would make them a lot of money. All the nations wanted to leave it. Even there's the verse in the Bible that shows you how important that these things were. Listen to this verse. Now when the turn came for each maiden to go into King Aziris after being 12 months under the regulations for the women, since this was the regular period for their beautifying. Six months with oil of beer and six months with, uh, with spices and ointments for women. Six months with oil of beer. This was Esther, the savior of her people. She had to go through the six months of oil of beer. How much money would that cost? A lot. Who will pay for it? King Aziris. Who will get rich out of that deal? these people, the Nabataeans. So they were trading in the frankincense and the mir, but it was a chance for them to go through the desert and take out the Edomites, like the prophecy of Obadiah says, because that was the time of the exile, and Edomites started leaving this area, going up, and these people were taking over their trade. This was one of the major trade this right here, this road, because you go through the desert all the way up, and then to the Mediterranean, to export to Europe, or here even, to Gaza was one of their major ports. But why did they choose to go to the desert when they already had the sea? Because you can't control the sea, the sea is dangerous. When the ship goes down, you lose everything. Now in the desert, the elements can be controlled. You need water, you need transportation, you need protection, and you need the merchandise. They already have the merchandise. Water was collected throughout this desert, although it's an arid desert, but there is rainfall in the winter time. But it's very quick, very rapid. You have to be very smart to catch it, and they were smart to catch that rain. Sometimes it's only for hours. But if you're ready, if you have everything ready for it, you can collect it. So they did that. Transportation day, it was the revolutionary, uh, revolution was domesticating the camel. And the camel is a marvelous animal. He can go through this desert for three to five days without water, and for 50 in the winter. For 10, 15, 20 kilometers a day, loaded with 100 kilos on his back. That's how marvelous this element was. So that's your transportation. Protection. You go through the night, looking at the stars for coordinates and counting steps. And the last thing, and of course we talked about the first thing actually, the fourth, was the merchandise. They had it all. So you don't have to go to where people live and pay them taxes for water. That's very scarce in the desert. No, they collected their own. And that would make them a lot of money. Now, they also went to India and China and bought frankincense and, uh, sorry, I brought silk and cinnamon and spices. You mentioned all of these things. They also went all the way up to the north, 
to the mountains of, mountains of Gilead, which are in Jordan today. You read about the mountains of Gilead, right? In the Bible. What was the mountains of Gilead famous for? Bomb. Remember the bomb of Gilead? B-A-L-M. Bomb of Gilead was famous. Now, why am I saying this? Here's the other verse that I think connects them to Ishmaelites, to the sons of Ishmael. It's from Genesis 37:25. This is the story of Joseph after his brothers put him in the well and were discussing with each other to kill him or not. It says, Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing. Frankincense, Bob, and Mir, and they were on their way to Egypt. What does that tell you? This is a stronger connection, in my opinion, that connects the people who are talking about the Nabataeans with sons of Ishmael. Now, after a while of doing this, after they controlled all of this trade, they became very rich because they had two journeys a year summer journey and winter journey. On each journey they would make approximately 4 million US dollar for every 800 to 1,000 camel caravan. That's a lot of money 2,000, 3,000 years ago. And that would make them, make them very rich. And finally they became a civilization, an empire. They went up in the ladder of the civilization. They became really a force, a big force. They even became an empire that was all the way up to Damascus. And they used that money to build their holy city. The city for the afterlife, the city for pilgrimage, and that's what Petra is. It's not the city of trade, it's not the city for exchanging camels and, and slaves and money and, and having uh, parties at night, no. That was outside Petra, elsewhere. Petra was the place for worship, was the place for pilgrimage, and I have proof for that at the site where we go. Now, they did not do it here in the southern desert, no, they went up here, a little bit further to the north. Why? Because the southern desert is made of granite. It's very hard, you can't carve it. But Petra, this area, first of all, the location is beautifully next to the King's Way. And they needed the roads for train. There's water, there's Wadi Musa, there's the springs. And there's security because the way to enter the mountains which they carved into their holy city, yes, they carved their city from sandstone. The way to enter and get into that location is to walk through a mountain. How can you walk through a mountain? Because this mountain cracked because of an earthquake 10 years ago and there's an opening in the mountain that you have to walk through. This is what we're going to do today to get to the Holy City. So they went out for the sandstorm, for the protection, for the water, for the trade, for the, uh, for the king's way and they built their Holy City here in this location. And it is a marvelous thing and it was at its peak between the 2nd century BC and the 1st century AD. What happened in the 1st century AD? Exactly in 106 AD, Rome, who was trying, and even the Greeks before them, who was trying to control the, Rome, the Nabataean Empire and to stop paying the money and to go get the goods themselves. They, they couldn't do it before. But in 106 AD, Rome became so powerful that they finally managed to annex Petra and Petra became part of the Roman Empire. Became the province of Arabia. And that is very important to remember that name, the province of Arabia, Petraea, the rocky Arabia. When we talk about Arabia, of course, you know that Arabia does not mean Saudi Arabia that we have today. No, Arabia was much more than that. Even all the way up to Mount Pebo was part of Arabia. And we hear that 5th century pilgrim, Algeria, the Spanish lady, saying that she had a hard time when she crossed into Arabia to climb up to Mount Nebo from the valley. She said that Mount Nebo is in Arabia. This was all Arabia. And this is very important when we're at the site, remember that. So, what happened in 106 AD? The Romans came and they annexed Petra. Petra became part of the Roman Empire. And then, they continued under the Roman rule to do their trade, and we see them all over the world. We see them in China, in India, in Italy, there's a Nabataean temple that was found one of the ports in Italy, so they were all over the place. So it seems to me that they had a good deal. They let the Romans in, 
because the history does not record any war between the Nabataeans and the Romans, and they still took their trade. And when Rome became Christian, the Byzantine period, most of Petra became Christian. Some of what they carved was transferred into churches and cathedrals, and there were new Byzantine churches, 5th century churches built in Petra, in the rock. And then there was this devastating earthquake that you might have heard of in 749 AD. Trade was shifted, earthquake ruined their city. They gradually started deserting the city, and last we hear about it is in the Crusader time. And then it got lost from the maps, lost from history for about a thousand years. Until 1812. Nobody knew about it except the local tribes who live in this area. Some of them actually were living inside the site, inside the holy city of the Nabataeans. But everybody else in the world forgot about Petra until 1812 when Johann Ludwig Burkhardt, Swiss traveler, came looking for it. There was a problem. The locals were looking for gold in the ancient site and they would not let anybody in. So Burkhardt had to live with the locals, learn the language, dress up as a pilgrim, grew a beer, brought a goat and went to the local tribe there and said, tribe there and said I'm a pilgrim. I want to go up to Mount Aaron. Remember I told you that Aaron was buried here, according to the early Christians. I want to go up there and sacrifice this goat at Mount Aaron, remembering Mount Aaron, remembering Aaron the brother, the brother of Moses. And he managed to fool them, and they let him in. And the way up to that mountain goes through the old ancient city. So he rediscovered it and went back to the Western world and told them about this in 1812. Johann Ludwig Burkhardt. Any questions? Last couple of uh, minutes, I will tell you just some more uh, important dates in history about Petra. When Jordan became a country, we'll talk about how that happened tomorrow on the way to the border. Petra started getting a lot of archaeological dates and a lot of uh, interest from tourists. The local tribe here was starting to make money. In 1985, the UN decided to make Petra a World Heritage Site, but you can't have people living in a World Heritage Site. You have to move them. The only, the only way to convince them to move is that we grant them still the ability to make money there. So they are there every day making money from 9 to 5, or from the beginning of the site until sunset in the morning. And these local people are still there. I'll tell you later on after lunch how to deal with them today. But we did move them and we built a small village for them behind the site. That was in 1985 when Petra became a World Heritage Site. Another important date is 2007. After a three-year vote by the International New Seven Wonders Committee, Petra was announced to be one of the New Seven Wonders of the world. And it's the most visited site in Jordan. And that's what we are going to go and see. Any questions? about their uh, religion, who they worship. Uh, they were pagans who had an array of gods and goddesses. Now remember these people were looking at the stars all the time. And that was part of why they chose this location as well, because it's connected to celestial occurrences in the year. So they had the god of protection. They had the god of camel caravans. They had the god of the mountains, the Petra mountains, and called Shara mountains. Their main deity was Dushara or Dusaris, the mighty god of the mountains. They had a trinity of goddesses. 